The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. From New York, The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. This is Ed McMahon, along with Tommy Newsom and the NBC Orchestra, inviting you to join Johnny and his guests, Buddy Hackett, population biologist Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich, and his leading critic, demographics expert, Ben Wattenberg. And now, here's Johnny. just don't have enough erogenous zones to go around. Uh, even for myself. Uh, well, you keep applauding like that and we'll let you out when this is all over. We're going to have an interesting show tonight. We sure This are. is going to be... Uh, what a parlor. I see a lot of out-of-towners here tonight uh, with their loved ones. And during, a, during the commercial break, you can make a phone call to your wives if you'd like. <laughs> Kidding at home, wives. Hey, I was... It's warm today. It is warm in New York today. How really actually, warm? It's kind of. Uh, <laughs> How warm is it? Where? <laughs> Here, in New, Here York in New York today. I don't know. How warm? Is it? <laughs> Just once. No, it was hot. Really, I saw a bumblebee back his stinger into a popsicle. <laughs> I actually saw that right here in New York today. I was up in Central Park. Hey, speaking of Central Park, did you read this yesterday, what they're doing? The city of New York is importing a temple from Egypt to be placed in the middle of Central Park. Isn't that interesting? That's what we need, is a temple, so we can go in there to pray to get out of the park alive. <laughs> no, it's hot. I ran in today to uh, NBC's crack meteorologist and resident Pop-Tart, Dr. Frank Field. <laughs> what we call him, and I said, what makes it so hot? And do you know what this dummy said? Bonzo, the god of sandcastles, was taking a sauna. This is our crack meteorologist. Bonzo? Bonzo. Yes, Bonzo, the god of sandcastles, is taking a sauna. Didn't you hear it? Yes. Oh. I, I had never heard that name before. Bonzo. Bonzo. Oh, yes. I keep getting this down, but it doesn't seem to get much better. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about pollution tonight. We have Dr. Paul Ehrlich and Mr. Ben Waterman with us in ecology and so forth and population explosion. But the Hudson is bad. It is really bad. Uh, I went over, I saw a fisherman today. He turned his back for a second and his worm made a break for it. <laughs> I mean, that's... Oh, I say, thank you, Grady, I needed that. Uh, filling in for Doc, uh, who's on vacation, is Mr... <laughs> Mr. Excitement, Mr. Tommy Newsom, one of the fine musicians. <laughs> His nights are murdered. Things that he finds exciting. You know how he kills an evening? He goes down to the Dairy Queen and watches the guy dip the cones in the chocolate syrup. <laughs> well, you like that, huh? You told. <laughs> What else happened? Oh, did you see we have a new setup in the Postal Department? The president signed the Postal Reform Bill today. It's about time. The Postal Service in this country is not great, true? You know I'm still getting paychecks from who do you trust? <laughs> see how they remember? Yeah. <laughs> how many of you remember a show called Who Do You Trust? <laughs> Like you froze. What happened? <laughs> oh, I tricked me. He goes out of my I go into one of these. You know. 
Uh, have you ever tried to go down? No, they, they say it's now a private enterprise. Is that right? The Postal yeah. Service is going to be run like a, on the guidelines and principles of a private corporation like uh, Con Edison, the Penn Central. <laughs> oh, we're in trouble. I went in the other day. I want to tell you the service is bad. Why am I working like Bob Hope? But I want to tell you. I went in to do a, I took a letter in. That's what I did. <laughs> what did you do? Well, I went to the post office to mail an airmail special delivery, and the guy tied it to the leg of a chicken. But, <laughs> That's what he did. Well, uh, Arnie, we'd like to hear some sports news. <sighs> sure. <laughs> Joe Namath finally called the jet coach. Did you hear that today, Weeb Eubank? He apologized for the trouble and inconvenience that he called him, and Joe said, that's okay, Weeb. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's true. Cool. Exactly. We got a good show tonight, put together our, by our producer, Rudolfo Tellez, uh, who just returned from a, uh, a pilgrimage. He journeyed to a chapel down in Juarez, where he knelt before a tray of tacos once blessed by the Frito Bandito. <laughs> Ooh, the thing he does every year. Uh, Buddy Hackett is with us. This is a strange show tonight for the, the guest bookings. We have Buddy Hackett with us. Uh, <laughs> you should see him. He's crazy, crazy. And uh, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, who is the author, I'm sure you probably know by now, of The Population Bomb. And a gentleman, an author, Mr. Ben Wattenberg, who, uh, who takes more than a slight issue with Dr. Paul Ehrlich going to be here tonight, so it should be a rather interesting discussion. Wouldn't you say so, Tom? It's close. Six, hmm? Sixteen hours. Sixteen hours. I wouldn't repeat that for money. I wouldn't either. Oh. Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Go back. I heard Buddy Hackett. No, no. <laughs> you didn't call me? You can stay here. I thought Chris Valiant lived. I, uh... Who I was in you? your, uh... What? Bonzo, the sun god. Bonzo! I... Bonzo! No. When I was in your... What? I was in your dressing room sipping the warm broth that you take before you go on. Yes. So when I heard my name, I thought you called me. But if you didn't, there's a little broth left. Actually, <laughs> I will go down. Actually, what I said, you'd be out later. And you came out early. You finally learned to talk. <laughs> Skinny Buddy Hackett, look at that. No! Skinny Buddy Hackett. John, you have, have no idea how hard it's... it is to look this way. If I ever really... When the Playtex goes, it's... No, <laughs> I have nothing. I've just learned to walk this way. Right. But I feel that I need help. You understand? How do you say this without getting bleeped? But when you stand this way, there's no way to use a certain room in the house. You just walk like this all the time with all pulling in and tightness. Well, stay out of the kitchen. And it, <laughs> the kitchen yeah. got me this way. <laughs> it's the, uh, the relief quarters. Relief quarters. Yeah, you can't go because I keep walking around sucking your gut and pulling your hips. And when they hit, you're gonna die. <laughs> you're gonna be in pain and hurting. Yeah. All right. right. You gonna do a commercial? No. Then you're gonna come out and no, uh, I, talk No, I about? thought you called me, John. <coughs> That's it. And I always want to be right, right on a button. Why don't you stay? There's no sense in going back now because you're coming out anyway right after this. Oh, really? So why don't I do now, that? Now, let me ask you something now. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you pick the commercials at random and then bill them? Or... Uh, <laughs> Or do they sign up with you in advance? We just put them on. I mean, you say they say they just. Who should we? I mean, because I know everybody's dying to be on this sure. show. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, like O'Sullivan Heels, if you were to mention them tonight, could you bill them? Sure. Well, O'Sullivan Heels. Yeah, when I was a kid, they used to have a thing with a winged foot, and you right. put them on, and the shoes didn't last as long as the heels, because. My mother paid a dollar sixty-nine for the shoes, and then heels were sixty-five cents. It was an old guy with tax in his mouth. He used to go like this, and everything would be ready Tuesday, even if you came in Tuesday. <laughs> what happened? You're nuts. You're nuts. Not me... only am I nuts, I'm bombed out of my pipe. Not again. Not again. <laughs> no, he's not. No. Hey, hey. And now we'll yeah. be right. <laughs> You 
suck on Ed's nose and see how you feel. <laughs> we use that as a beacon for the birds when they go south <laughs> during the summer. During the winter, they go south. Yeah. And now, two little words that mean good crunching, Frito-Lay. Oh, I used to be with them. When people eat Doritos, one good crunch leads to another. It's not just because they're bigger and crisper than most snacks. It's because Doritos taste as good as they crunch. Try Doritos tortilla chips. One good crunch leads to another. When a girl watcher looks once, then looks again, he's doing a double take. New Diet Pepsi's getting its share of second glances, too. One sip, and you'll find yourself checking to be sure it is a Diet Cola. You'll do a double take. New Diet Pepsi tastes so great, you'll do a double take. back. My first guest tonight is already here. Yeah, that's me. You're out quick Augustus tonight. Caesar. <laughs> you keep changing. Your, your hairdo is going a little more. Uh, My the, hairdo the has been this way since 1946. But the fat has been up around the hair surrounding it. How did you comb it before? Did you ever have a part? Yeah, I had a part once and I had a ball. That was the last. No, I don't mean the movie. Yes, yes. What? <laughs> Didn't you ever have a part in yeah, your I hair? Yeah, I used to part my hair on this side. And then I stopped parting it on that side. And then I stopped using gook on the hair, just natural. That's right, I don't wear anything. And you can't... No, I don't put any uh, and you hair part, And your hair parts, though. Yeah. Well, mine, if you don't put something in it, just you can comb, you can comb till your nose falls off. It just stays that way. Remember the old joke that guy tried the hair? Remember that joke? What was that? Remember about the part, he wanted to change it, so he went to the barber? Yeah. And they put the part this way, from ear to ear. Yeah. The guy says, how's it working? He says, not bad, but everybody keeps whispering in my nose. Don't you remember that joke? <laughs> joke. T tell it. <laughs> Do you remember the new joke? Which one was that? <laughs> uh, well, as a guy says to another guy, I don't know if I'll remember it because I'm just going to make it up now. <laughs> guy says to another guy, says, Sam, I have got for myself. He says, it's funny for you to talk that way, O'Leary. <laughs> he said, I got for myself a hearing aid. It's beautiful. It's a brand new hearing aid for a person who couldn't hear a whole life. To finally have something, it's magnificent. I spent $1,800 for a hearing aid, and I'm, it's perfect. Everything the first time, birds, elevators, you press a button, zing, I hear. Beautiful. <laughs> he says, what kind is it? He says, it's four <laughs> You like that joke? I like that joke. Did you hear the one about the woman goes to the dentist? They have the tooth out? Yeah. Yeah. And he looks in the mouth. He says, that tooth will have to come out. She says, I'd rather have a baby. He says, make up your mind. I got to adjust the chair. Did you ever hear that one? <laughs> These two guys got on a streetcar. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not going to. Why? That's a cute joke. That's a cute. What's the first joke you ever told in public? You remember it? In public? Yeah, when you were, you were real young and you were just getting started. Well, when I was on the 
You mean professionally? Professionally. What, what kind the of... The one that got me locked up? No, no, don't tell that one. Well, that's the one. <laughs> John, I don't believe you ought to ask me that. All right. First I of all, I, don't, I never did jokes so you until did later what? on. I thought once they were done, you couldn't do them no more. You have to make them up. So that's why well, I was very lucky. I made up a lot of stuff. Yeah. You just came here today, I understand, on the... Who's playing? You flew in on us. I come in here on one of them Lear jets. See, now, ex-president Lyndon B. Johnson. Yes, I remember. He has one person clap. <laughs> Are things so much better now? <laughs> Tomorrow night, I'm going to Austin, Texas, and they're giving a testimonial dinner to the attorney general of the state of Texas. I think his name is Bob Barnes. Mm -hmm. He's only 31 years old. And he was the first one to ever get two million votes. This is supposed to mean something. No. Yeah, but I remember when Johnny Desmond got two million votes on WNEW <laughs> and lost. <laughs> to Julius LaRosa, I think yeah. it was very close but that year. I'm going there because Del Webb, who I work for, yeah. You worked for him, too. Yeah, I remember. I... Actually, you worked for me. Because I'm the vice president of the, of the Sahara and Nevada several other hotels. Right? Yes. In fact, there's, I appreciate that you work for us. You do? Yeah, because I know that you can get one and a half times the salary if you would go to work for the Hebrew National across the street. <laughs> what is the name of that The Hebrew hotel? National? Yeah, the one that Kirk... Crocorian owns. That's the international. The international. The international. Not the yeah, Hebrew what? national. <laughs> Hebrew national, just wishful thinking on my part. Anyway, I know they would offer you one and a half times the salary they we would? pay you. Sure they would. Oh. You didn't know that? <laughs> no. I, I thought didn't. you stayed with us kind of me. You mean the money is that important? No, no. Of course not. John, there's one thing you don't need. One and money. a half times as much. Huh? Yes, one and a half times as much. They would give you. No, I like it where I am. Yes, because we have at the optimum an 800-seat room, and they have a 1,600-seat room sparsely filled. When they fill it up, it's 2,217 people. That's what I hear. If you can do it. Yeah. There's very few people have done it. I know. Elvis, Elvis did it one night. He'll be out there. There was no charge. He'll be out night. there next week. <laughs> <laughs> See, I go out there next week. And Elvis and his I'll motorcycle go. gang were out there with <laughs> shotguns. Says you, you in there now? <laughs> I blow you <laughs> off. Get into that room. Get into that room. I didn't know they said. Get in there now. I karate your nose. I bust your jaw. You go sit watch Elvis. <laughs> Elvis gonna perform right now. You know that, uh, uh, so I was down there in Durham, North Carolina. You were down at Duke University again for That's the, That's uh... right. I go down there to lose weight on that rice diet. But I don't eat the rice, and I don't eat the diet. I go down there, I drink a little moonshine. Well, you've lost about 35, 40 pounds. You drink a little moonshine and see what you can hold on your stomach. <laughs> I have been throwing up for close to three weeks. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I've changed rooms 17 times. 17 times? <laughs> oh, yeah. What would, you, what would you like to weigh? What do you want to weigh? Three rooms less. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kempner, yeah. uh, the German doctor, ah. who doesn't know yet that I'm Jewish. Ooh. Oh, no. I said to him, well, it's too bad we lost the war. <laughs> and he treats me like a nickel. <laughs> Meanwhile, I have wired his house, but the day I hit my weight, I blow it up. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta sell something here. You don't have to sell yes, anything. I'm gonna ruin this group. No, you're not. Oh, that's great. Johnny Winters. Isn't yeah, that Johnny that's Winters? Right. Right. Jonathan it. Winters. That's right. Oh, his, he, he's such a funny fellow. <laughs> well, you're starting early, aren't you? We have a surprise guest tonight, Maud Crickert, with a whole new bag. Hi there, old makers. I'm here to tell you about Hefty's new plastic scrap bag. They finally solved the problem of what to do with wet kitchen scraps. Just set one on its own little stand and then stuff it with all the wet nasties that used to sop through the bag on the way to the garbage can. When it's full, just tear, 
Try and toss it away. Dry as a bone. New leaf-proof hefty scrap bag. You get some here and tie one on for more day. <laughs> yeah. New hefty. Hefty scrap bags from Mobile. And don't forget, when garbage starts piling up on you, use hefty trash can liners and wrap up the problem. Big, strong, hefty liners are leak-proof, odor-proof, plastic, and leave the container clean so one can can do the work of more. Hefty, hefty trash can liners. Use them. I start to ask you, you said that you really, you told me in the office earlier. Yeah. Well, I, Buddy's one of the few people we never plan anything with on the show. He just walks out and we say, let's see what happens tonight. Thanks, John, for saying that. Because yes, a lot not. of people say to me, how much rehearsal do you do when you're going with John? I say, well, John, you don't need any rehearsal because he'd never remember anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If I can't help a guy... Then I hope your farewell appearance here tonight is a big one. <laughs> if it's my farewell appearance, John... It'll be because I'm taking that seat. Well, you better go back on the rice and drop about another 50 if you're going to take this seat. I've got a very small... I could drop 50 with a room and a half. <laughs> you, you told me you want to get down to 135 pounds. 134 pounds is what Dr. Kempner said would be ideal for me. That's when you perish at 134. I'm only 5 feet 7. You're I'm 6 feet tall, right? Just 6 feet. And how much you weigh? 160. Okay, 160. They say it's five inches, five pounds to an inch. I'm 5'7", all right? Mm. And I'm now 195. So there's a difference between us, 5'7". Uh, five, five inches. Five inches is 25 pounds, right? So 25 from... <laughs> John, there's a lot of things that are not exactly right in the figures. <laughs> that. That's right. Yeah. You know a lot about medicine, right? Oh, you kidding? I'll take any dose they hand me. How's your cholesterol? Now, did, my they, cholesterol did they check your cholesterol all yes, the time? Yes, they did check my cholesterol. And how was it? They'll cash it anywhere. <laughs> 230. My cholesterol is 230. That's a high normal. That's good. I could have a low normal, but I hate to stoop. <laughs> all right, you dummies, you laugh when I say something. <laughs> You're in here free, and don't you forget it. <laughs> Now, I don't like no hostile groups. <laughs> Mr. Berger? Yes, Mr. Mason. Oh, <laughs> You're going out to work soon, aren't you? At the, uh, I'm September? going back to the Sahara? Sure, I go yeah. September 8th. I go right after the fun ends. When, after Labor Day, when things get slow, yeah. then I go in. Whenever there's rough time of the year, I go in. Really? Yeah, and I can't understand why I always get the bad time of year and then I figured out I book it myself. <laughs> You're the vice president. Yeah. Why you go in then? Well, because <coughs> we need me then. Uh-huh. So I go in then. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, I can prove that we've won more money at the hotel with me being there than any other artist. Really? Yes. The suicide rate is two and a half times as high. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in there. Yeah, when I'm there. You talk but about... only from people who have watched me. Can you drink when you're on this rice diet? Obviously you can. No, you cannot. But when you come on this show, if you don't drink, you just ain't with it. 
their bombs, your bombs. No. Bomb. Rudy's bombs. <laughs> the only one sober. <laughs> if I want to be sober, I got to sit with the crowd and they'll rip me apart. <laughs> But well, I'm having a good time. Yeah. I, I told you I brought this minister up with me. Did I tell you I brought a minister up with me? You brought, I met a gentleman up here. He said he was a Methodist, right. Methodist, a Methodist minister. Methodist minister. I brought him up from Durham, North Carolina. And uh, the guys at the golf club, I played at Hillen, uh, not Hillen, I played at Willow Haven Country Club down there in Durham. Yeah. And they said, you son of gun, you took that old Methodist minister up there and you show him some of that for New York. You're going to bring him back a rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a nice gentleman. He's a very nice, like gentleman. A nice gentleman. Yeah. We're, we're converting him now. I, <laughs> I'm fitting him for a black hat. <laughs> oh, look at this. Yeah, you can't eat. Pizza nuts. No, pizza hut. Pizza oh, hut. Pizza, pizza hut. hut. Yeah. I can see that small print from here. Well, when you lose all that weight, the eyes go oh, too. Yeah. They diminish. I've lost a lot of retina. Sliced mozzarella cheese. <laughs> mozzarella. Mozzarella. Yeah, do we add you mind your mozzarella? Mozzarella. 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 Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut pizza. What a treat. Ever wonder what makes them taste so good? Well, this sliced mozzarella cheese, for one thing. It's a very special mozzarella cheese, blended and aged to meet strict Pizza Hut specifications of moisture and butterfat content. Now, most pizza shops sprinkle on grated cheese. Well, granted, this is fast, but as you can see, it's difficult to get an even layer of cheese. See, there's a hole here, another one over here. Well, at the Pizza Hut, we don't use grated cheese. Instead, we use sliced mozzarella cheese. We lay it edge to edge all across the pizza. This ensures that every bite will be a combination of all the ingredients not just the crust and the sauce. Sliced mozzarella cheese, another reason why the Pizza Hut makes the best tasting pizza and why we serve more of them than anyone else in the world. Right, Doctor? Right on, Big Daddy. <laughs> and you know there are over 550 Pizza Huts coast to coast. I'll drink to that. Mm. <laughs>
Buddy said he was going back to <laughs> You paid for the lessons, you play them off. <laughs> you played for the chart, play every note in it. <laughs> Buddy said he was going back to slip into something comfortable. Here. Hungawa. Hungawa Masimba. You have no idea how happy I am not to hold my breath in anymore. <laughs> I was choking to death in that suit. I know you were. It was two sizes too small. I'm supposed to look that way. Another one. Oh, the bartender. You look like you look like a Jewish Buddha going to a freakout. <laughs> uh, well, what do you call this? There's a name for this, isn't there? Well, there's it, it, it's called it's Big a... Robe. <laughs> Giant cloth wear. <laughs> it's, uh, in African, it's daishiki. That's what I meant, right? Daishiki, and uh, in American, it's a uh, kaftan. You could have a family of elves move in, move in there with you. A family of elves. Yeah. I, I, I knew I heard it somewhere. Do. I, yeah. Why do you wear this? Just for comfort? No, I wear guess? this because I start to perspire a lot in the other clothes. I put this on, I cool off. Oh. When I dry off, I put the other clothes back on. <laughs> I've never worn this on a bus because it's hard to zip down. <laughs> <laughs> A little touchy, eh, John? <laughs> yeah. I know you. Why? I know you. Look, right now you've been on more years than par. You're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to go this way. <laughs> you fool! I don't want to go with Let a naked me man. Let this no. and you're free. <laughs> Once I open this up and a giant butterfly goes out. <laughs> drops a cocoon in the audience <laughs> and the chrysalis <laughs> assembles dusts off its wet wings and says <laughs> did you do what have you thought of a home you know just that <laughs> nice where you could go and be I taken have a nice care of home. you don't have a beautiful home well yeah you moved since Beverly I... wills but california i thought you moved since i saw you last didn't you Beverly move? wills didn't you move from uh, that place on sunset Sunset? Oh, yeah. You that moved. was three years, John. Well, I haven't been I haven't been to your house since. We moved over to Walden. I haven't been there. Remember the night With you were in my house? Huh? You came at 10 to 11. And you stayed till 10 to 5 in the morning just looking around. <laughs> the last thing you did was straighten your tie as you fell into the record player and broke into the <laughs> No. Yeah. No, no. Oh, yes, you did. No, no. Okay, me that. He did it! I swear! No. My hand, my hand to God, he went and he fixed his thigh <laughs> and he fell backwards into the record player, broke all the records, and said to my wife, Sherry, class, all class. <laughs> Wait a minute! Hey, I'm all right. If you... Get up, I'm gonna tell it all! If you hadn't I'm had to... the truth! <laughs> If, yes. you, if your record player hadn't been in the pool in the first place, I would never, never fall The up. record player was behind the piano. No one knows how you did it. Then, Jack Rayo offered, you remember Jack Rayo, Patty Page's manager, offered to drive him home to a boat staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. So Jack Rayo took him home. John's, uh, John uh, had all his facilities, you know, because he said, anim, 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 anim. <laughs> Don't you give me that either, because well, you will never challenge my veracity. <laughs> oh, let me have my top top. No. Now, Jack takes him home, puts him in his room, takes off his clothes, John turns around in his shorts and says, There's a man in my room! <laughs> That's, wait a, wait minute. a minute. All right, that's contestant number one. You want to send in the second liar? There is no lie. You, you, re, you forget a, things. I don't forget things. You forget things. I happen to make up my mind to tell about a quiet night. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell about the other night? No. Oh, all right. Want me to tell you about the time you went for a haircut to the masseuse? A haircut with a masseuse? <laughs> oh, you're terrible. I You're am? Terrible. You make these That's things up. That's what you said about the masseuse when she gave you the haircut. <laughs>
You want to lock up? I've got a show. <laughs> All right. How about tonight? No, no, no. Me and you and Ed. Oh, you get him in on it. Yeah. We went to Danny's, right? Yeah. We just went to have a quiet right. little dinner. Just right. the three of us, right. right? Now, I know we was a little late in delivering the food, so we had a couple <laughs> of uh, aperitifs. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that well. The next thing I remember is me coming into Danny's the next night and you and John hiding from me. <laughs> As though I had done something wrong. <laughs> Can you believe a man who acts like this, friends? <laughs> How about you, when you walked out? Yeah. I heard it. I wasn't there. I couldn't come yeah. to the opening. Yeah, I walked out well. On what? A, at the Sahara Tahoe. At Not the, the Sahara Tahoe. Oh, no. the new, the King's Castle. King's Castle, which I'm one of the owners. And you walked out on stage, Let's as I understand Let's the part it. about me being an owner. You're an owner. Right. And you walked out on the stage wearing nothing but a fig leaf. Is I that true? I did not wear nothing but a fig leaf. That's what it said. I was wearing a coin. <laughs> A large denomination? It was as big as a half a dollar. <laughs> what else do I need? <laughs> Five dimes. <laughs> All right. Did you hear what I said? All right. Five dimes. <laughs> All right. Now. I really want, I really wanted to walk out stark naked. That was, I really wanted to walk on stage stark naked. I had to. I saw Oak Hall Cutter. Yes. And I saw the people naked on the stage. And I said, I've done everything in show business. I've done everything on stage. But I've never been out naked on a stage. I've never been on stage naked. And I had to see what it felt like. Now I'm in my own joint the first night. I got, I own two points. Don Rickley's owns two points. Don Rickley's. You know him? Yeah. The bald kid. Right. Yeah, he used to be fat and he lost weight. But he'll blow up again. <laughs> Don Admins. Don Admins. Is yeah, okay. the kid who dials his shoe and gets his wife. Yes. Right? Yeah. Wood Allen. Mm -hmm. He also owns two points. Right. right. So now I think I'm an owner. It's opening night. Who's going to challenge me? I wanted to go on naked and I chickened out. I put this little metal with a little bit of elastic, just like that, and the metal just hung there. <laughs> and it, uh, it covered a medallion's worth. <laughs> and I went out on a stage, but I really want to be completely naked. Now what? I saw Oak House cut it, and I said, I've done everything there is to do on stage. What does it feel like to be naked on stage? What does it feel like to be completely naked? I've got to know, I've got to know, I've... And I went out there naked, John, except for that little thing, which was really nothing, because it... it covered... It did a good job. <laughs> Unfortunately. And... And I walked out, and I discovered, Ed, that it meant nothing. Do you know why? Because all my life, I've been naked on stage. I've never lied to the public. I never gave him any junk. I never handed him, I never told him any lies. I never, I always, what's in here came out of here. It was always gut level communication. I've always done it. And what I wear had nothing to do with it. Like right at this moment. Yes, I try to be in good taste to a degree while I'm here. I go as far as the lower, you've never bleeped me on the show. Do you know that? I don't think we have, maybe. No, 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 John. Ask Rudy, have you ever bleeped me? When the time comes for me to bleep, I'll go, I'll bleep myself. <laughs> but that's the way I am. Are I'm you going to work that way all the time now? Let me finish. I don't even know oh. what I'm going to say yet. Oh. <laughs> I've always... No, I'm not going to work that way all the time, but I had to feel like what it was once. And I found out I've always been naked on stage because nudity, when you're not trying to be lewd, when you're not trying to be... Uh, what, what's that when you try to create a, 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 a feeling of sexual desire, when you're not trying to stimulate... Erotic. No, that's an old word. There's a better one than that. Better than erotic. Purian. 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 Yeah. 
Prurient. Yeah, look, a lot of them guys know that. Prurient. <laughs> well, you got all these perverts working here. <laughs> Uh, well, I was not trying to be prurient. I was trying to be free, and I found out I am free, and I never have to walk out naked again. Free again. <laughs> and now let's join Alice in Laundry Land and see what's washing with snowy bleach. If you kiss me again after this... Snowy Bleach presents Alice in Laundryland, where there's less ironing because of permanent press, like the outfits on Never Need Iron and Never Need Press. But they lamented how to bleach our things. Chlorine bleach can discolor some permanent press. Happily, Alice can use Snowy, the safe bleach that contains no chlorine. Snowy whitens and brightens without damage or discoloration. Snowy bleach, safe for all permanent press. Well, let's face it, I'm no Alice in Laundryland. I don't do any washing, but I do plenty of wearing. And I know how permanent press, from shirts to unmentionables, can become permanently dingy. I also know how to prevent this dinginess with snowy bleach. It's the one right bleach for permanent press. Use it every time you wash to keep whites white and colors bright. Snowy bleach keeps permanent press from getting permanently dingy. back to the Dinah Shore show. <laughs> Is she here? No, I was just making... You know, I never was able to watch Dinah's show. Why? I'm diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> She's not All that right. Good. All right, folks. Don't you pick out what you like. <laughs> and you got to encourage me when I'm weak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, no. I'd never show them. You think I want a line following me? <laughs> we just did that. Yeah, terrific. It has no enzymes in it. That's there. right. It has no chlorine either. That's right. No soap, nothing. It's just a box. <laughs> <laughs> we make a bundle on that one. Do you? Oh. Well, figure that in the past, John. <laughs> Don't figure I'm losing your sponsors. Figure I'm cutting your tax structure. <laughs> You're giving us more time on the show. <laughs> hey, your son's here. I met your son. I don't think I'd ever met your son before. My son Sandy is here. Yeah. Yeah. You have uh, one boy and... One boy and two girls. Two girls. I have Ivy and Lisa. Yeah. When my son is the one I wrote the poem about when he was bar mitzvah a year ago. You want to hear that poem? You want to do it? Well, I wrote a poem called Bar Mitzvah. In the Jewish religion, when a boy is 13 years old, he becomes Bar Mitzvah, son of the commandments. He becomes a man. And I wrote, Why a man, O oh Lord? Why a man? He's just a boy to me, O oh Lord, just a boy. His back is straight, his eyes are clear, his heart is golden pure. His mother's breath still feels his warmth. A womb each twist and turn. And I want still to take his sins. It is a right I've earned. Do twelve years make a boy, O oh Lord, and thirteen make a man? Humbly I ask, is this the way in your universal plan? What mysteries has he solved, O oh Lord? What havoc has he wrought? 
He's never made a war, oh Lord. He's never even fought. He's never learned to hate. Oh Lord, it's not his natural way for boys. All boys are seeking love, no matter what they say. When I think of all the slips I've made, I look at him and I'm afraid. But I was afraid when he first walked. And I was amazed when he first talked. He'll do it, Lord, I know he can. Please take him and make him. All things that turn a boy into a man. Good work. That's very nice, Russ. Now I'm afraid I've embarrassed him. No, I don't think you should embarrass, should embarrass, him, embarrass him at all. Him. If it was honest. He's my son, and I mentioned my whole life. And <coughs> I remember when I was daughter. 13, I came home from school, and my folks had moved one day. <laughs> you see, this uh, did, they leave, did they leave a forwarding? No, in? no, no. They were just gone. Did they tell the neighbors? No, no, nothing. And, and you just... Just came home and it didn't move. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You want to do this? All right. You want, you want to stay a while? You want to cut or... Can we meet your son? Can we meet your son? Because I've got uh, Dr. Ehrlich and... Uh... Meet Sandy. Where's Sandy? Is he on the audience? I'll do this first and see if we get Sandy down here for a moment. We'll return in a moment right after this word from Rexall Drug. <laughs> Hold it! That's why I tell you, you shouldn't have drunks around. <laughs> now, here's Ed with a word from Rexall Drug. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! A great game, but after a few hours on the field, oh, those aching muscles. That's why the National Basketball, Basket uh, Baseball League, rather, <laughs> I'll get it yet. The baseball. I have this reminder even. The baseball league has chosen through as its official pain reliever. Through is the unique analgesic with active painkillers that actually penetrates deep into underlying muscles. Relief comes faster and more completely because pain is eliminated at its very source. That's why, whether you've been playing golf, batting tennis balls, unleashing your Australian crawl, or just getting in some summer yard work. Through is the pain reliever for you. Don't settle for a surface remedy when you are able to get those aching muscles solved or minor rheumatic or arthritic pain. Get deep penetration through the official pain reliever of the National Baseball League. You'll find it exclusively at your nearby Rexall drugstore. Welcome back to Open End. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's Rawhide, yeah. It's Rawhide, you're crazy. You're the most uninhibited man I've ever met in my life. I am not uninhibited. Just I have my inhibitions. I have, but I'm very filled with love. John, I'm going to make a confession. I happen to love you. I love you very, very much. I love Ed. There's a lot of shows 
similar to this, I don't go on. Why? Yeah. I don't have any feeling for the guy who runs him. I just... Yeah. And people say, why don't you go on? I, I don't know. I make up... There's a difference. I love you. Yeah. I love Ed. <laughs> why don't we three shut these lights? <laughs> What kind of furniture do you enjoy? I mean... I like I Danish cleft. <laughs> Danish cleft. <laughs> what? <laughs> ah. Don't ask me. Why me? Why me? <laughs> Why you? I've just observed. Why? Am I I'm imposing? I'll go away, I'll never come back again. What do I It was care? a rhetorical question. I could always go on Joey's show. Is he on? Is who on? <laughs> Joey? Yeah. No, but no one told him. <laughs> shows up he still every... shows up every night. We run a tape. We're not going to embarrass him. <laughs> he and his friends got together. We went to the studio. It cost us thirteen hundred a week, <laughs> and he thinks he's on every night. Ah, oh, when, when do you when do you leave for Texas tomorrow? I'm leaving for Texas tonight. Oh, awesome. my Lear jet with Captain Friday. And I'm going to see Lyndon B. Johnson and Bob Barnes, the lieutenant, the, the lieutenant governor, governor of the state of Texas. The youngest one, yes. Yes, and he's a very young man. He's a very wonderful man. And I sure hope he can dance. <laughs> well, maybe his card won't be full, and you'll have a night. Nice... Where's your son? Let's meet your son. Where I you don't know where tonight? he huh? is. Would, 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 would it embarrass him to come out? But it embarrassed my son. Come on, where's Sandy? <laughs> Come here, Sandy. Hi, right, all right. All right. Yeah. How are you, Sandy? Bye, thanks. Fourteen, right? Right. You plan to be a, an entertainer? I'd like, like to be. Like your dad? What would you like to do? Comedy? I'd like to play yeah. pro basketball. Pro basketball. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing's wrong with you, Sandy. <laughs> That's the entertainment field. Uh, no, I, I meant more of an, an a former stand-up entertainer, comedian, etc., something like that. Maybe. You think you'd be tall enough to be a pro basketball player? I take a lot of vitamins. You'd follow your dad? Now, you're very slender. Your dad has a tendency to, to go a little... Yeah, that's right. Why don't you come on with that? That he's slender and I'm fat. And he's blonde and I'm black hair. But you see that toe? Yes. <laughs> See I that? got one, too. That's right. Got... And he said to me, They're teaming what, up. Dad, why do I have a toe bent like that? I said, because otherwise your mother would be dead. <laughs> I, I had to bring that up, didn't I? You had no choice. We got it worked out. <laughs> you, you, you're setting me up. Yeah, but Where did you go to school? Elrodale. Well, I come. graduated from there. I now go to Beverly Hills High School. Beverly Hills High School, huh? How do you like it? Hills. Beverly Hills, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you bring your two daughters out and they can hit me? I don't want to bring them out. They're the smart ones. <laughs> I'm having enough trouble as it is, right? Yeah. Ah. Take it easy on them, will you, Sandy? I need this job. <laughs> ah. So you really gonna you play basketball at Beverly Hills High School? No, I I I'd like to make the team. The coaches are giving me a hard time though. Really? Why is that? I don't know. I'd like to find out. Does, does he play basketball at all, bud? He plays basketball, and uh, what he sh he hasn't said to you is he has not yet started high school. He just finished eighth oh, grade, I see. and he is starting his first year of high school in September. And if the coaches are giving him a hard time. We will have some other coaches. <laughs> That's democracy in action. That's right. That's right. It's a lot easier to get new coaches for a high school than to buy a whole basketball team. <laughs> you, was a, you were a prize fighter one time, if I remember. Uh, an amateur. I was a, a amateur boxer. I was not very good. I never lost. You never lost? No. In fact, one night I did lose, which uh, entailed beating up the 
referee and two of the timekeepers. But you never and lost. then I won, as there was no one else left to count. <laughs> and you. they had few stupid rules that I didn't agree with, like you're not allowed to box with an axe. <laughs> 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 you must stay in the ring at all times, little things like that. Mm -hmm. But wow. we changed all that. Hey, Sandy, I thank you for coming out here tonight and joining us. It's a pleasure. And I hope uh, your high school goes real well out in California. And I hope so. Make sure your dad comes back and He's sees you. He's going up to basketball camp now in West Point. Willis right. Reed Basketball School. Yeah, that should be great. Yeah. One of the great players of all time. I hope he learned something. Yeah. He will. Yeah, I keep trying to tell him the foul line is got nothing to do with karate. With what? Karate. Oh, you don't foul while you're in there, you mean? No, he studies karate. Are you studying karate, too? Oh, yeah. When he fouls a guy, the game is over. That's it. <laughs> Sandy, thanks for being with us. Huh? You. See you soon. Buddy. Hello. We'll return in a moment, right after this word of interest. You want to go with your son? Yeah, go. Buddy. Okay, buddy. Come on. I'm actually Snavely being of sound mind and body to hereby bequeath the following. To my wife, Rose, who spent money like there was no tomorrow, I leave $100 and a calendar. To my sons, Rodney and Victor, who spent every dime I ever gave them on fancy cars and fast women, I leave $50 in dimes. To my business partner, Jules, whose only motto was spent, spent, spent. I leave nothing, nothing, nothing. And to my other friends and relatives who also never learned the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. Finally, to my nephew Harold, who oft times said, a penny saved is a penny earned, and who also oft times said, gee, Uncle Max, it sure pays to own a Volkswagen. I leave my entire fortune of $100 billion. you'll stay with us for the rest of the show. It should be extremely interesting. We have Dr. Paul Ehrlich, the population biologist, the author of The Population Bomb, and a gentleman who takes issue with him, who has written an article called The Nonsense Explosion, Mr. Ben Wattenberg. They'll be with us in just about one minute.
Welcome back. Dr. Paul Ehrlich has been with us two times before on this program. He is a population biologist at Stanford University, and his book, The Population Bomb, has sold nearly a million copies. This is his latest publication called Population, Resources, and Environment, which are issues in human ecology. Um, another gentleman with us tonight, Mr. Ben Wattenberg, is an author, and he's an expert in uh, demography, which is uh, the statistical study of human population. And uh, his latest book is called The Real Majority, which he uh, has authored in conjunction with Mr. Uh, Richard Gammon. He's also the author of an article in the New Republic called The Nonsense Explosion, in which he, uh, he takes direct issue and challenges uh, many of Dr. Ehrlich's opinions. And we thought it might be interesting to have both of the gentlemen here tonight. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Paul Ehrlich and Ben Wattenberg. Gentlemen. <laughs> All of a sudden, I feel like Lawrence Spivak on Meet the Press or something. This is a, a little bit different for us. Uh, I thought maybe to start, uh, if it's all right with Mr. Wattenberg, we'd kind of let uh, Mr. Ehrlich uh, just briefly, in the time we have, give the premise of the population bomb and what you and give some of the what you think are the critical issues of the population explosion. And then we'll let Mr. Wattenberg comment and kind of go back and forth tonight. Well, I think uh, the main premise is that there are 3.6 billion people in the world today, and we're adding about 70 million a year, and that's too many. It's too many because we are getting desperately short of food. As a matter of fact, the most recent indications are that the so-called Green Revolution is going to be less of a success than we thought it was going to be, that we're very much short of other resources, and that above all, the very delicate life support systems of the planet, the things that supply us with all of our food, ultimately with all of our oxygen, with all of our waste disposal, are now severely threatened. I would say that trained ecologists are divided into two schools. There's the optimistic school, of which I'm a member, that feels that if we should stop what we're doing now very rapidly, that there's some chance that we'll manage to prevent a breakdown of these systems. There are others who feel the changes in the weather, that the permanent poisons that we've added to the planet have already entrained the sequence of events which will lead to disaster. Uh, they feel it's already too late. Uh, I think the only practical thing to do is to pretend it's not too late. So we're in deep trouble, and I'm worried about it. I noticed when you said you're one of the optimistic, Mr. Wattenberg, uh, chuckled a little, because I, from what I understand from his article, he calls people like you prophets of doom, and you're creating a hysteria when there should not be any hysteria created, and you're making a, a real crisis and overemphasizing the case. Is that, is that true? Uh, that is essentially uh, the point that I made in the article. Uh, I, I think that um, we, we ought to talk to begin with about the United States, uh, because that's uh, with the current system of world law or lack of world law, it's really only in the United States that we, can, that we here can do anything uh, about the problem. Now, my view is that in the United States, uh, the problem is not too many people. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination as I see it, is the United States a crowded country. Uh, the Netherlands have a thousand people per square mile. Uh, in England and Italy, you've got five or six hundred people per square mile. In France, you've got three hundred people per square mile. People travel to Switzerland for its scenic beauty. Its mountains, part of it is, is uh, uninhabited. And it's got 400 people per square mile. In the United States, we've got about 57 people per square mile. So by no stretch of the imagination uh, is, is America crowded in terms of density. Uh, furthermore, the American birth rate now is at an all-time low. It's gone down for each year in the last 13 years. Uh, if you wanted to play some of the projection games that some of the population explosionists play, you could say, theoretically, uh, in X number of years, there won't be any Americans at all because the birth rate has been going down for each of 13 years. Uh, for, it's as low now, slightly lower, in fact, than it was during the Depression in the United but States. What is the rate now, around 1% or a little over? 1% uh, population growth, right. Uh, well, wait, let's, let's, since we have a whole series of things to discuss, let's talk about those for a second. Uh, one can never, of course, discuss overpopulation or underpopulation in terms of area. By those standards, the moon is underpopulated, the Pacific Ocean is underpopulated, and so on. For instance, let's take the Netherlands, a good example. Uh, the Netherlands uh, doesn't have 900 and some people per square mile because there are lots of square miles that the Netherlands uses that aren't in the borders of the Netherlands. In other words, the Netherlands is a grossly overpopulated country which can't possibly survive without massive imports of virtually everything it needs from overseas, including huge amounts of protein, for instance, which the Netherlands receives from the protein-starved peoples of the Southern Hemisphere. And what about when Mr. Wattenberg says, when he says the United States now, which has around 206 million people and is a well, large country. If you're, going to, if you're going to discuss the United States as an isolated thing, it's like talking about air safety without talking about uh, pilot error. 
In other words, we are a massive importing country. The only way we manage to maintain our level of so-called affluence is by importing much more than our per capita share of what the world can supply. In other words, we can't live this way. If we closed our borders, uh, then all of a sudden our so-called standard of living would plummet immediately. In other words, it is preposterous to speak. No, no trained ecologist, for instance, would ever discuss population, overpopulation, or underpopulation in terms of people per unit area. Uh, Australia is an overpopulated country in spite of the fact that it only has about one-tenth of our population because Australia has not got the resources. It can't uh, produce a lot of the things that it needs. Overpopulation or underpopulation refers to numbers of people relative either to resources or to values or to the stresses they put on these life support systems, which are absolutely essential. I, I think uh, the point that has to be understood is that uh, resources is a, is a very flabby sort of a term. 300 years ago, uh, nobody thought that coal was a resource. A uh, hundred years ago, no one thought that oil was a resource. Uh, Thirty years ago, no one thought that uranium was a resource. Uh, now we've learned how to use these things. Uh, so it, we're, uh, the only real resource that man has is his brain. Uh, it is what men can do with their brains in, in using what nature has provided is the only real resource in the world, except perhaps space. Uh, now, when we take, uh, <coughs> Dr. Ehrlich has, has, uh, has argued uh, that this, uh, this system of we taking things from other, from other nations is somehow uh, immoral. What, what is not understood, I think, is that, uh, for example, we import tin from Bolivia. Uh, that tin is not a resource to Bolivia unless someone wants to buy it. They, they could produce all the tin cans in the world. Uh, and they couldn't do anything with them in Bolivia. It's about three million people, and they could just sit there with a great big stack of tin cans. It wouldn't do them any good. This is a, a very simple process that uh, has been growing over the centuries, and it's called international trade. We bring in things, and we send out things. Some of the things uh, we, uh, we send out are of great value to the world. We send out tractors so people can, can uh, produce more food. We send out medicine and drugs. Uh, so that people can live better lives. Uh, and you do this through a system of international trade, and the medium is called money. Uh, well, you we buy also, tin, well, and they can buy, buy penicillin. Well, first of all, it's not entirely money. It's also the Army and the Air Force and so on, and find the CIA, uh, which we send out to these places to make sure that these places remain in the capacity of commodity suppliers to us. If you look at the records of the UNCTAD conferences, and so on, it's, I think it's apparent to anybody who's looked at the world trade situation that the overdeveloped countries keep it very carefully under control to see to it the flow of things that they need comes to them. By the way, let me also correct you on something. The birth rate this year is higher than last year, and it is going to continue to go up. If you look at the current statistics coming from the Census Bureau, the monthly reports, as everybody expected, as the cohort of women enlarges, as the Second World War, post-Second World War baby boom babies come into production as they are now, the birth rate is going back up. And so we, we have no sign whatsoever of any kind of end to the population explosion in the United States. In fact, all of the predictions are for considerable more growth. The only debate is, is it going to be 75 million more people or 125 million more people or some number larger than that? You mentioned, Mr. Rottenberg, in your article, you thought that the United States did comfortably support uh, twice the population and possibly even four times. When do you mean support? Do you mean uh, uh, I, I, as our standard of living as we have it now? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think the problems we have in the United States almost exclusively are not the problems of too many people. They're the problems of what people do. Uh, for example, I, I mean, I, I, I agree, as some of the ecologists have, have pointed out, that in, in, in many ways, uh, Americans have, have raped this country. We've done terrible things to our, uh, uh, to our resources. I think Dr. Ehrlich would agree I, to I, that. I think we're in absolute sure, agreement right. of that. All right. Now, the question is, if we went to ZPG, zero population growth, which right. Dr. Uh, Ehrlich uh, is, is in favor of, and, explain, and, and, and I'm not even against it. Don't, let's don't explain it. the term zero yeah. population growth. Well, so just, uh, I, I'm in favor of both halting population growth, that is, bringing the growth rate, which is now about 1% to zero, and then starting to slowly reduce the population size so we can get down to a size which can be managed eventually. Right. Now, if we went to zero population growth tomorrow, uh, Lake Erie would still be an ecological slum. That's quite it, right. It, it's, it's catastrophic and it's immoral right. what we've done to Lake Erie. Dr. Ehrlich has argued that uh, the crime rate is high because people are packed into ghettos. Uh, this is not true, uh, as, as far as I can determine it, and, uh, because the highest crime rates in the United States are in areas where people have been leaving, where you actually are uh, on a downward population curve. Uh, and if we had zero population growth tomorrow morning, it wouldn't do anything 
it a crime problem? Uh, people have argued that uh, um, the national parks are so terribly overcrowded because we've now got so many people. Uh, actually, the national park visits to the national parks in the last 20 years went up by 400%. Uh, and when, when the population was growing up, uh, was going by uh, up by somewhat less than 30%. So 370% of that increase was because we've created a society in the United States where a man has a three-week vacation and you've got interstate highways and he can afford a camper and he's got a decent enough income that he doesn't have to work for those three weeks. Mm -hmm. And he's going out now to see those beauties of nature that he never really had a chance to do before. Well, what happens now, if you add another 200 million people? Well, I, 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 let me say this. Uh, I don't think we should add another 200 million people. I think this is something that uh, I would agree with some of the more moderate proposals that Dr. Uh, Ehrlich has, has come, uh, come forth with. I think we ought to understand that our population is growing. It is growing much slower uh, than, than it has previously. There are indications that it will stop growing uh, in, in, a, in X number of years, whether it's 10 or 30 or 50 uh, is, is unknown uh, for now. But for example, a number of states have passed abortion laws now. And we've seen in the past, uh, for example, when Hungary had a very free abortion law, uh, the population went not only to zero, but it went minus. And again, if you wanted to play the, project, uh, the projection game, you could say that in so many years, there wouldn't be any Hungarians. Uh, then they revised the, uh, uh, the, the abortion law, and it's now slightly positive, the, uh, the birth rate again. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that's my feeling. All right, let me interrupt one moment, which we'll have to do from time to time, and then we'll take up uh, the subject again. Right now, here's a word from... Who is the word from? <laughs> New York, the New Kent Menthol. Yes, that's who the word is from. How about that New Kent Menthol? Wow, Kent got it all together. Kent got it all as for me, it's got everything. They should have done this years ago. Got it all together. A new Kent Menthol 100. A new kind of menthol refreshment. Refreshing taste that comes free and easy through Kent's exclusive Micronite filter. Brisk, breezy flavor. Famous Kent filter and good, rich taste. They're all together now. A new Kent Menthol 100. All the refreshment of menthol. talking uh, with Mr. Ben Wattenberg and Dr. Paul Ehrlich about uh, basically population explosion. Do you think, Mr. Wattenberg, that uh, people like Dr. Ehrlich are creating an unnatural crisis when they talk about overpopulation and uh, is a prophet of doom and it's really not that important? No, I think it's very important. And I think that the service that Dr. Ehrlich has performed, in the past at least, that uh, Rachel Carson uh, uh, performed, are extremely valuable in a, in a democratic society. There must be people who will get up and say, here's, here's trouble, here's a crisis. But I honestly think that there also has to be some balance. In other words, uh, I find that a lot of what Dr. Ehrlich has written, while it ha always has a core of truth in it, is overstated, is over-exaggerated. And you reach a point, and I think it's been generally true in this country over the last 10 years, we seem to have faced so many crises. Everybody is getting up and saying, my God, this is the greatest crisis in the whole world. It's the greatest crisis. Vietnam was the greatest crisis in 100 years. The race problem was the greatest crisis in 200 years. The poverty problem was the... And now we have the greatest crisis in a billion years, which is the, uh, 
ecology crisis. Uh, and it seems to me that sooner or later, you suffer a credibility gap, to use uh, uh, an old phrase. Uh, is that I, I don't think, I, let me put it this way, I didn't believe it when Chicken Little said the sky was falling in, and I don't really believe it uh, when Dr. Ehrlich says it. Now, I think we have very great problems in the United States, we have, and, and, and great problems throughout the world. But I don't think that we solve them uh, by overstating them. Is the sky falling, Doctor? Well, let, let's put it this way. You're really, first of all, let me say that I consider the Vietnam War and racism to be all part of the same mess. So it's really one big crisis. I am a doomsayer because I do believe doom is coming. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, Mr. Wattenberg is essentially in the position of the person saying, well, you're trying to sell me insurance, but I have life insurance, but I've never needed any before. Uh, <laughs> let me, uh, <laughs> let me, uh, can, can I turn professor yeah, for a minute? Right. Because I, I first want to agree with, with Mr. Wattenberg about something, and I want to produce a, a very simple little equation. You're going to scare me. Uh, no, it's very simple. It's D equals uh, N times I. You could say damage to these life support systems that we're so concerned about, the things that we have to have to keep going, is really a product of the number of people times the impact of each person on the environment, the negative impact. In other words, you've got two factors how many people you've got, and what the people do. Now, it's quite true that if we stop population growth right now and let our environmental impact remain high, you go down the tubes. If you start cutting down your environmental impact of each person and doing things differently and let the population continue to grow, <coughs> the product remains the same and you go down the tubes. What you've got to do is operate on both of these things at the same time. You've got to both reduce the size of the population and you've got to reduce the impact of the individual, the way the individual treats the environment. Now, I think one of the things that's wrong with a lot of the arguments about no connection between population growth and pollution or environmental deterioration is the assumption that most people make that if you add 50% to the population, that what you're going to do is increase pollution by 50% or environmental deterioration by 50%, and that isn't true. It's more than that. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have two cities of one million people separated, say, by 10 miles, and you've got 10 miles of freeway, in between them. Now you increase the population 50% by adding a third city of a million people, equidistant from the other two. Unfortunately, you end up with three times the original amount of freeway, a lot of cars driving around, a lot more smog. What's worse, there's a forest in the middle here. Originally, the amount of smog coming from cities A and B was 85% of the amount that forest could take without being killed. Now you add city C, so long forest. You've got threshold effects. A thousand people can live along a thousand mile river and their sewage can go right into it and you're right in the ball game because the natural system has the capacity to buffer it. You put 10 million people along that river and you got a pollution problem. Your environment's going down the drain. So you can't, there's not a simple relationship. If you have the number of people in the United States, our environmental problems would become much less serious than they are now, much less than a half. If you double them, you're going to four, five, tenfold. You and other uh biologists feel that the United States has enough population right now. It's some, something over 200 million. Can you think and, of a reason why we'd have more? And a lot of people think that it shouldn't even be less. And Mr. Rottenberg uh, seems to think that we could have 400 or 500 million. And uh, well, wh I'm, why this I'm, great disparity? I'm, I'm not advocating four or 500 million right. people. I, I think the United States could be a, a nice place to live with four or 500 million people. I think it could be a devastating... <laughs> A, a, a devastatingly terrible place to live with only 50 million. I, I don't think that the, the basic problem is the number of people. Well, don't, don't you think, it is, don't you think yeah. the other problems would be easier to solve if well, we had fewer people? Well, uh, to some extent, yes, they would, but, uh, uh, but uh, to some extent, no. Uh, for example, in the... <laughs> Can I have a kiss on stage, buddy? My mother wouldn't believe it. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All I can tell you is, the man built a pawn shop. <laughs> All right, is that look, right? I got to do the commercial. I knew you got to do the commercial. That's why I walked on. John, Some great American go. homes. John. Yes. I forgot where I left my airplane. <coughs> I don't know. Where I don't I have it, bud. Oh, okay. I got to go. Some there. great American homes have one thing in common. <laughs> Here's best interior latex paint. The Reverend George Whitfield's compassion for destitute children founded the oldest orphanage in America in Savannah, Georgia, 1740. Hardships plagued the Bethesda home for boys. Their first winter they would have starved had not Indians brought fish and corn. 
For over 200 years, homeless children have been loved and cared for here at Bethesda, which means House of Mercy. Today, we're freshening these busy rooms with Sears' best interior latex paint. We used semi-gloss, long-lasting paint with a smooth, satiny finish. It comes in all your favorite colors, and hand prints, stains, and smudges wash away with soap and water. Sears semi-gloss can stand 8,000 scrubbing strokes if it comes to that. Sears' best interior latex semi-gloss for great American homes like yours. I think it's time for you to answer this now. You seem to feel that, the, although you said you're not necessarily for the United States having 400 million people, but we have some 20 million people or thereabouts in this country who are living, they say, right now below a substandard level of, of in poverty and in ghettos. Uh, wouldn't it be better to limit the population as soon as possible and, and try to solve their problem before we add another 25 million or 50 million people? Um, if that were the equation, I would say certainly. Uh, I don't think it is. People, uh, a very famous demographer once said, people are born not only with a mouth that has to be fed, but with two hands to do things. And, and this is the basic equation. People produce as well as consume. Now, I don't think there should be 400 million people in the United States. I would like to see population level off in, in, in this country as quickly as possible. But I don't think it's grounds for, for panic. I don't think we're n anywhere near a panic situation. The little model that Dr. Ehrlich drew uh, shows uh, that if you put a third city in between those two cities, yes, you would cause great pollution. But I think uh, one of the things we ought to be doing in the United States is putting that third city someplace else. It, there's no reason that all the new people have to go in between Boston and Washington or San Diego and, uh, and, and San Francisco. Well, they do because that's where the jobs are and that's where the industry is and that's where the... Uh, uh, some of the things that people want to do uh, following are, up are, 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 are located. But you do fly over this country and you look down and you say, my God, look at all the land. Most uh, of the, uh, one out of three counties in the United States in the last 10 years lost population. Uh, Generally three, for very good reasons. Though. Well, that, that's right, for very good reasons. Not a question not is... Not enough water to run industry, not enough water for agriculture. Well, no, uh, the, the reason is, is, is somewhat different. It's that we've perfected our agricultural system to such a point that where it used to take, uh, where, where one man could only feed eight people, now one farmer can feed 50 or 60 people. So, so this is why people have left. But in areas of the Midwest, particularly in parts of the South, in parts of the, of the Northeast, there are wide open spaces and very beautiful places to live and not uninhabitable because in fact people lived very good and decent lives there until very recently. Now because of an agricultural revolution largely, many of them have been driven off the land. Now the question is, why the, the, do the next 30 or 40 or 50 million Americans, and I personally think that's probably about where we will level off, about 250, 270 million people. Why do they all have to live in New York City? Why do they have to live in Los Angeles? There, there, are, very beautiful, there are very beautiful places in this country well, that, are, that are begging for people. Then why aren't the uh, people in, there? In, in Nebraska. Then well, why doesn't Nebraska and Iowa grow? Well, uh, I, I, I think that there is uh, a lot of momentum underway now that I think, and I, if, if part of it is a, is a negative push out of the cities. People are saying, enough already. It's, it's too tight in here. Let's go see uh, if we can live someplace else. Uh, and part of it, these states uh, and these areas are beginning to say, uh, you know, let's see what we can do to attract people uh, into this area. And I think it needs a push from the federal government, frankly. I, I, I think the United States ought to have some sort of a... Uh, 
of a positive population policy. This is nothing, nothing new. We had the Homestead Act in the United States. That was a population policy. We, uh, we, uh, the federal government supported railroads. Uh, so, so that yeah, was but a you're population talking, policy. If you, if you build industry in these places for these people, since you, obviously they can't farm, then you're going to spread more intensive smog into farm areas, or you're going to pave over farm areas. Yeah. It just won't play. If, you, if, you, if you've flown over the eastern United States, you know that the, smog, the heavy smog belt now covers at least half of the country on this side, and a very large chunk of California where it's killing off a lot of agriculture. Well, now, well then scientists, ha I mean, uh, there are things that produce less pollution and things that produce more pollution. Now, we have got to go in this country sooner or later, and it, it ought to be sooner, to things that produce less pollution. Uh, but uh, we, we, very they, difficult. They, it's very <laughs> difficult, but it's happening. Uh, uh, the, the new cars have 60% less pollution. Oh, than that's, a car. oh, that's nonsense. Well, that's, 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 utter, my, that's my utter. data. That's my data. Yeah, no, no, that's not your data. That's the automobile manufacturer's data for cars that have never run anywhere. And less pollution. They'd never tell you whether it's the hydrocarbons or the asbestos from the brakes or the PCBs and what have you. Well, that's I, all I, Mickey I, I, I can't argue the, uh, the scientific data with you, but I... I uh, <laughs> uh, but there is legislation now. There will be more. Uh, they are working on, on pollution-free or semi-pollution-free uh, automobiles, and uh, this is what this is what we've got to come to. We have to break away from all that. Gentlemen, I really wish we had more time tonight. We barely scratched the surface, but I thank you both for, for being here. Ben, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, the audience uh, thanks you also. Uh, we want to mention one thing. Yeah, if you want to help in this problem, write to zero population growth, Los Altos, California, 94022. You got, you got anything, Ben? Hmm, you're with that eye. He hasn't got a group. Tomorrow night. Aretha Franklin, the Gold Diggers, Rodney Dangerfield, and Lady Edmund Jr. Good night. Thanks again. The program was pre-recorded. <laughs>